something that man has come up with. Because Jesus, while he was speaking to Nicodemus, established the truth of being born again. Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3, 3, Truly I say to you, unless one is what? Born again. So it's not a man-made philosophy. Christ said this, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. We just got through talking about entrance in the kingdom. But Jesus says it's a matter of the heart, not a matter of what you do on the outside only. So to enter the kingdom of God, Jesus clearly says that one must be born again. Not by experiencing, as Nicodemus was puzzled in his question, a, a second biological birth, but rather through a spiritual birth. Because at repentance, as we read the word of God, we know that a new order of life is opened to us as believers in Christ. So being born again is more than simply being saved. A lot of times we throw that, that term out there, saved, so loosely. But there's no life transformation. There is no development of the character of Christ. That it's just a term that we say, I came down, I prayed a prayer, I'm good. It's so much more than just praying a prayer and saying I'm good. It's about life transformation. And being born again opens to us, as Jesus says in John 3, 3, and Paul rehearses again in Galatians 2, 20, being born again opens to us the supernatural dimension of God's kingdom order. His kingdom order becomes a reality in our lives, in the way we think, in the way we speak, in the way we perceive life, in all that we do. And following our born-again experience through our confession of faith in Christ as Lord and Savior, we begin a new journey in life. As Peter said and as Paul said, the old has passed away and the new has come. In Romans 8, the entire chapter, it reveals this new and this wonderful life journey that is open to those who are in Christ and are spiritually born again. And an important truth that Romans 8 emphatically reveals is that this new life in Christ, it depends extensively on the work of Holy Spirit. It is impossible to live for Christ without Holy Spirit. It's impossible. Christian's source of victory, our source of victory in this journey is directly connected to the person of Holy Spirit. Our attempts to live a Christ-like life in our own strength will only lead to exhaustion. How many of you have been there? I've been there. Will only lead to frustration and ultimately harm to ourselves and others because we're trying to make it happen and we can't make it happen. Why is that true? Why is it true that our attempts to live a Christ-like life only in our own strength just leads to exhaustion and frustration and, and harm to ourselves and others because Holy Spirit is the one who enables us to overcome our struggles. Holy Spirit is the one who enables us to rightly interpret the Word of God so that we may properly apply it in our lives. Right interpretation leads to right application. And Holy Spirit enables that within us. And we grow in that as we become more sensitive and yielded to Him. Holy Spirit is the one who empowers our lives so that we can effectively live and we can effectively share the message of the gospel of Christ. And from these references, we can plainly understand that the yielding to the work of Holy Spirit in our lives is the direct means of our ability to live a victorious life in Christ. We surrender to Him, we can live victoriously. We have struggle in surrendering to Him, we're going to struggle in living victoriously in Christ. Romans 8 reveals this new and this wonderful journey 
that is open to those who put faith in Christ. And through that, we have the direct work of Holy Spirit in us. So we're going to begin this Wednesday and for the next few Wednesdays on this journey together through Romans chapter 8. It always begins at the beginning. That's in verse 1. So let's look together. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And how long could we just spend there and worship and testify? This first verse sets forth one of the most important truths of our faith. When we look here, the first word we're presented with in the English is therefore. And have you heard the definition for that word? We need to see why it's therefore. There's a reason. I know that's kind of maybe South Alabama East, whatever you want to say. But there's a reason this word is therefore. Because it connects what has been said with what's about to be said. And the word, therefore, it leads us to expect a result that flows from the preceding text. Therefore is a connecting adverb that ties what Paul has said in chapter 7 with what he's now about to talk about in chapter 8. And in chapter 7, Paul asked the questions in, in, or the question in Romans 7, verse 24, and I'm reading this out of the New Living Translation, kind of putting it in our vernacular. Paul asked this question, oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? And he didn't just leave us there because he answers that question in verse 25. Thank God the answer is Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen? He's the one who saves us from sin that leads to death. So because of the fact of salvation through faith alone, and that's explained to us by Paul in Romans 3, verse 21, all the way up to here in Romans 7, 25, because of the fact of salvation through faith in Christ, we can now be saved from this sinful nature. So when we, by faith, we profess, we confess, we believe in our heart, and we confess with our mouth who Christ is as Lord and Savior of our lives, Paul says in verse 1, and I'm reading out of the New Living Translation again that we've just read, now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Why is that so important? What does that word condemnation even mean? The word that is translated for us in the English from the Greek as condemnation is a word that includes both the sentence and the execution of that sentence. So we've gone before the judge, and the judge has sentenced us. And not only has he sentenced us, he executes that judgment right then. That's condemnation. We receive the, the, the sentence and the execution. So therefore, we can say that condemnation is the end result of judgment. But Paul says, now that we are in Christ, we are no longer under judgment, but what are we under now in Christ? Grace. Now again, grace is not God's willingness to wink and forget our sin, No, grace is God's power working in us that enables us to conquer our sin. There's a difference in that. So we can't allow God's grace to be at work in us while we're sinning, right? Because it's God's grace that enables us to overcome sin. Because God's grace is greater. What did Paul say? Where sin is, what is greater? Grace. Grace. So no longer, since we're in Christ now, there's no longer the sentence and the execution of that sentence, which is judgment. No, why? Because we are now under grace. So being under grace in Christ, we are no longer condemned by God. And being that our life is now in Christ, we have been justified before God. 
And justification is the beginning, it is the basis, it is the starting point for sanctification. Before we can begin the process of sanctification, we must first be justified. And that word justified, it just means that we have right standing with God in Christ. When we stand before God, we're no longer condemned in Christ, but rather what? We're justified. We can stand before him, not in fear, but we can stand before him in love, as John said. The just penalty incurred by the sins of the human race was paid by Christ. We know this. And the unfavorable verdict has been removed. And now all those who are in Christ are the benefactors of forgiveness. And why is there no more condemnation? Paul answers that question in verse 2. There's no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because, verse 2, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. So what is Paul saying? Paul here is talking about two different laws, or we could use the term principles. There's the old law, and there's the new law. And what Paul is speaking of here is not the Mosaic law in verse 2. What he's speaking of here is the law of sin that governed our life because of the disobedience of Adam and Eve. We're born into that. That's what's natural. The old law is the power of sin that inevitably will result in death. And the new law, which sets the believer free from the power of the old, is the law of the Spirit. And this new law of the Spirit says that only by living in union with Christ can believers break the power of sin in their lives. There's no other way. And the new law of the Spirit which brings freedom from sin, it begins the work of sanctification, which means to be separated. No longer are we condemned before God and by God, but now in Christ Jesus, since there is no condemnation, and we've been justified in him, and there's a new law by the Spirit that is at work within us, God now separates us unto himself and consecrates us for his use. God doesn't use us. God flows in and through us. Because he doesn't manipulate, he doesn't try to do something that would harm. No, everything that God does, it brings life and it brings vitality to us. The sanctification, or we could say being Christ-like. That's what it means to be separated and consecrated. We're Christ-like. It produces something supernatural within us and it is produced by holy spirit who now dwells in our hearts and verse two we could really state that it is the thesis of what paul writes in romans 8 1 because there's a new law at work in our hearts there's no more condemnation no more because there's a new law new law at work within us And Paul describes it as the law of the spirit of life. This is the law, or we could say again, principle of the person of Holy Spirit. Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians 3, 17. um, And and I know I'm using the New Living Translation a lot here. But he says this, wherever the spirit of the Lord is, what is their presence? Freedom to do what? Not sin. Freedom to be righteous. Freedom to do what's right. Freedom to do what pleases God. Freedom to live a life full of the life that he desires to give. Not freedom to sin. Freedom from sin. How many times have you been there? I I remember my life, and and I've used this illustration before, but when this just clicked for me. I was struggling with something in my life as a younger Christian. I was struggling, just couldn't because why? I was trying to do it on my own. It was leading to frustration, discouragement. I remember where I was praying. 
that when there was a change, there used to be tears and all like, God, I'm never going to, I don't understand, I can't break this. But I remember not only that moment in tears when I would weep, I remember the moment when the chain fell off. And it clicked in my, not just my head, but in my spirit. Stop trying and surrender. The reality of this verse, there's a new law at work. And at that moment, the chain fell off. Never the same again. Because I have the power and the means to overcome that that displeases the Lord. Every one of us. It's not about trying harder. It's about surrendering and let the power of Holy Spirit work in and through our lives. So there was once the spiritual death because of our sinfulness. And now there is the spiritual life because we're in Christ. And we have now in Christ been moved by the indwelling presence and power of Holy Spirit into a whole new sphere. We are now spirit walkers. <laughs> don't, don't think of this weird. But are we not? We're spirit walkers. Now you say that phrase, you need to be careful who you tell that to. <laughs> they need to understand what you're saying and what you're not saying. But we are. We're not flesh walkers anymore. We're spirit walkers. Galatians 5, 16, I say then, walk in the spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. How do we not fulfill the lust of the flesh? How do we not sin? Make sure you're walking in the spirit. Make sure you're walking, because if we're walking in the spirit, Scripture says there's no way we can sin. <laughs> well, we're getting there. <laughs> walk in the spirit. Our struggles look much different. If you've read chapter 7 or up to chapter 7, man, you're like, oh, goodness, like Paul says, who am I? Who can save me from this? But when we look at our struggles in chapter 7, our life in chapter 7 and before looks much different as we come to Romans 8. Because even though the old nature never gives up, come on now. The old nature doesn't give up. How many of you are perfect? Don't raise your hand. How many of you never mess up? How many of you never sin? We all do. We all do. We mess up. Why? Because the old nature never gives up. It never backs off. The old nature never concedes defeat. We can live with confident insurance even though the old nature is there, it doesn't dominate our lives any longer. When we were in sin, it was the dominant power, right? But now that we're in Christ, who's the dominant power? It's not sin anymore because there's a new law at work in my life. It's Holy Spirit that brings resurrection power that we talked about on Sunday. It's not something we just celebrate one time a year. It's what we celebrate every moment of our lives, that I'm able to live different now than what I once was because my faith is in Christ. He is my Savior. He is my Lord. I have confessed my sins, and I've said, Lord, no longer am I living for myself. I'm going to live for you, but I know I can't do it, but it's by the power of your Spirit that I'm able to do it each and every day. A new law at work, so we have confident assurance, not in ourselves, but in the Spirit of God that lives in us, who now resides in our hearts. He's stronger. He is stronger. So the question in Romans 7 that Paul asked was, who will save me? That was Paul's question in Romans 7. Who will save me? And now as we move to Romans 8, for those who are in Christ, the question is no longer who will save me? The question is, who will I yield to? That's the question. Who do I yield to? What do I yield to? It is the Spirit of God who provides the victory. Trying to live the Christian life apart from the empowering presence of Holy Spirit will bring us to defeat, disappointment, discouragement. Because God never intended us to go at it on our own. Jesus said in John 15, 5, that apart from him, what can we do? Nothing. Not a thing. We can be like we were. That's what we can do. 
The victory of Romans 8 results from living in vital union with Jesus. That's what Jesus said in Romans chapter 15, or John chapter 15. Be connected, remain connected. And Romans 8 reveals the victory results from being vitally connected and in union with Jesus through the, the sustained and empowerment of the Holy Spirit. He's the one that brings that power. He brings the power of heaven into our lives that enables us to live like we're in Christ. Amen? He goes on and he says in verse 3 and 4, it says, For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. Aren't you thankful? There was nothing we could do. I know we've heard this preached. You've heard it taught. Some most maybe have heard it preached, heard it taught all your life. But does it grow old? God, no, it does not. Lord, help that it doesn't. Lord, forbid that it does. It's not old. For what the law could not do, and now he's talking about the law of Moses. In verse 2, he was talking about the, uh, the law of sin and death. But in verse 3, he's talking about the law that he gave. He says, for what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. How? How did God do it? By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. So anybody that tells you that Jesus did not have the same nature as us, anybody that tells you Jesus did not have the ability to sin, it's not scriptural. Why? Because what verse 3 says here, God, what, reconciled us to himself by doing what? By sending his son in the likeness of our sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. We're going to come back now. So that the requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but what? According to the Spirit. So when we look what Paul is laying out here in verse 3 and 4, the problem did not lie in any inherent weakness in the law. The law, in and of itself, as God gave it, was not weak. It wasn't weak. It didn't have issues. It didn't have flaws. It didn't have holes, if you will. The problem was who? Us. We're the problem. The problem was humanity's fallen nature, which was the direct result of Adam and Eve's disobedience in the garden. And this weakness was overcome by God, not by us, but by God, through the giving of his son, by sending him with a nature that was like ours. So in other words, Paul is saying through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that Christ took precisely the same fallen nature that we ourselves have. In other words, he was born flesh and blood just like us, with the ability to choose between right or wrong, and the ability to choose right, I mean wrong instead of right, but instead, what did he do? He constantly overcame the proclivity of sin. The onslaught is just continuously there. Christ overcame. He was tempted and tried like we were, yet what did he do? He overcame. He never sinned. Christ's mission, as Paul tells us, and other scriptures tell us, was to put an end to the reign of sin, to condemn that evil power that has since, you know, the dawn of history after the garden held the human race in bondage. And God's redemptive action in Christ was so that what the law just demanded for us might be fully satisfied. The law wasn't weak. In fact, God gave the law to show that what was going on in our lives. We were sinners. We were wrong. We were doing wrong. He gave the law to point to that, and Paul even speaks to that here in Romans. It was to make us aware of our sins, to make us aware that what we were doing was wrong. That's what this, the law was given for. But the law didn't have the power to save us. Why? Because of the weakness of our flesh. And God knew this, so he sent his son in our likeness to live that perfect sinless life, yet tempted like we were, so that we could overcome. Because God is a just God, right? And if God would have just says, okay, I'm going to let you slide. Have you ever done that to your kids? I'll just let it slide. 
it was wrong, you know. But God didn't do that. God didn't just let us lie. God didn't just wink at our sin. He didn't just turn a, 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 you know, a blind eye to what was going on. Why? Because if God would have done that, then God wouldn't be a just God. God is forgiving and God is gracious. Thank God he is. As David says, his mercies are what? New every morning. If they weren't, would there be any of us here today? But he's a just God as well. And what does his justice demand? Sin is to be punished, right? So in order for God to have grace but yet appease his nature of being a just God, something had to happen. And what was the something? Jesus came, God came to be our punishment. How could he be our punishment? Number one, he was born with the same nature as us. He faced the same struggles, everything that we faced, yet he overcame. But it didn't stop there. That wasn't enough. What had to happen? He had to give his life. Because he literally became the penalty, the penalty, let me say it right, for our sins. Do, do we grasp that? I'm not asking that in a sense that you don't understand it, but th does the weight of that really hit us? Does the weight of that really impact us? Jesus was the penalty for our sin. Jesus died because of me. Jesus died because of you. If you've watched The Passion, and I've alluded to this before, I'm moving on. Oh, there's a lot here. I I'm moving on. But I found myself, as I told you, when Jesus is depicted on the screen in the Passion, when he was being beaten. I mean, man, that, that was viral. I mean, literally, I did. Jennifer was sitting right beside me. She did. I was like, that's enough. You don't have to hit him anymore. They abused him. They spit on him. They ridiculed him. They shamed him. They plucked his beard out. They took the crown of thorns and didn't just place it gently on his head. You know, they rammed it on his head. Then we understand those thorns that are long, they're huge. They're not, you know, just flimsy and, 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 and weak. They're strong. If you've ever looked at that, that, that vine that they wrapped as a crown and it pierced his head. Continued to beat him and then made him carry his cross or at least the beam to Calvary. And here shows Jesus' humanity as he collapses under everything that has happened. And, and it's like we find ourselves maybe getting aggravated or getting mad because they were doing this to Jesus. Who did it? I did it. You did it. We did it. He suffered because of us. We're the cause. Does it hit us the weight of what, G, of what the Lord says here? In, in 2 Corinthians 5.21, the, the, Paul says this, God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The fact that Christ knew no sin was why he could receive Unto himself the penalty for man's sin and credit man with his own righteous standing before God. And that's incredible, is it not? Now for those who are in Christ, I'm hurrying. Skip, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you to come back so I'll hurry even faster. Yeah, come ahead. For us who are in Christ, we're those who live under a new law. We're no longer controlled by sin. We're no longer controlled by a sinful nature. An individual that, that, that's, that, that is struggling, what I mean by this, is controlled by the sinful nature. How can we say we're a Christian? How can I say I'm in Christ if I'm controlled by my sinful nature? I'm not talking about messing up. I'm not talking about stumping my toe. I'm talking about being dominated by sin. Bible says I can't because there's no proof of the new law that is at work in my life through the Spirit. Why? Because sin is dominating my life. 
It's impossible to live a life that brings glory to God if we're not daily yielding and learning to walk in the Spirit. There's no shortcuts. No shortcuts. It's about my willingness to surrender daily to the enablement of the Spirit of God within me. Surrender is our part while producing is God's work and His alone. If there is no spiritual production or a lack of righteous character in my life, in your life, then it directly points to my unwillingness, to your unwillingness to fully surrender. It doesn't mean we don't make mistakes. I want to highlight that. But what it does mean and what Paul is getting at is that sin does not dominate my life any longer. So the whole excuse, well, that's just the way I am, does not hold water with God. We're going to talk about as we walk through this, and this is just setting it up, we're going to talk about how to walk in the Spirit in the coming weeks. But what does this look like on a normal day? Because if I just give a theological discussion, you know, what good is that? We can understand the, the theology, but if we don't grasp the application, then how is the Word powerful in us and life-changing? What does this look like? Let's just set it kind of in story form, if you will. I'm moving. Just please give me, give me grace tonight. I'm sorry. Our alarm goes off, and then the first thing we pray is, Lord, I want to walk with you today. Holy Spirit, help me to do so. So we spend time meditating on Scripture, and we pray, crying out to God for His grace in the day that is ahead. We get into our car with the awareness that one of our weaknesses, one of my weaknesses, is the way that we respond to bad driving. But before our mind gets carried away, we breathe a prayer for God's grace to give us patience. We forgive our boss, our teacher, our colleague, our co-worker, our brother, our sister with the help of Holy Spirit or that so-called very difficult person again who says, whatever. We suppress a word of gossip that's trying to creep into our hearts, toward our mouths turn our eyes away from something we shouldn't give our minds or our hearts to we express thanksgiving to God for the presence of Holy Spirit within us we come home, we serve our family and we ask Holy Spirit to fill us with the strength to live out our conviction even at the end of the day we end our day in thanksgiving to God for his sustaining grace through the active presence of Holy Spirit in our lives through the day that has just passed now, I know that's a lot crammed into one you probably heard it said like I have that a person's character is the sum total of little choices that are made our spiritual walk is the sum total of a lot of little steps taken in submission to Holy Spirit and as we walk with Holy Spirit as we depend on Him and being filled with Him our desire to sin according to Scripture to, should do what? minimize because the desire is not there. As we walk through this, as we look together, God help us anew and afresh to walk in the Spirit. To walk in the Spirit. Because there is the telltale signs of am I walking in the Spirit? I talked about gossiping. I just I talked about anger, retaliation. These things that the flesh does naturally. But if a new law is at work in my life by the Spirit, who's there to catch me? And my desire isn't to fulfill the lust and the deeds of my flesh. My desire is to please my Heavenly Father. And to be a living epistle and witness that Jesus is the propitiation of our sin. Father, God, there's so much here so much here that Lord that we have just God just dipped our toe into the water Lord that as we begin to go deeper in these coming weeks Lord I pray a new 
and afresh that you would bring the reality that, Lord, there is a new law at work in our hearts and our lives as your children, and that is the law of the Spirit of life. Lord God, that we walk by the enablement and the power of Holy Spirit so that we do not fulfill the lust and the deeds of our flesh. Lord, I pray, God, as we continue this journey, help us to be sensitive, oh God, to learn how to keep our vessels in sanctification and honor and not in the lust of the flesh. Oh, can we stand together and can we just open up our hearts as we take this journey together and just ask the Lord, to just impress upon our hearts anew and afresh what it means to walk in the Spirit. And can we yield and surrender our hearts again and say, Lord, I want to walk in the Spirit. Oh, help me, Lord, each and every day, every moment of the day to walk in the Spirit. Come on, lift your voice tonight. Come on, lift your voice tonight. Oh, God, that it's not by me trying harder. Lord, it's not by me, God, making a decision. I'm not going to do this or do that. Lord, it's about me choosing every day, every moment of the day to surrender myself to the indwelling and presence of Holy Spirit, to surrender myself, ourselves, Lord, to the empowerment, oh God, of your Holy Spirit that enables me, oh God, to fulfill your law, God. It enables me, Father, to walk according to the character of Christ. It enables me to bear forth the fruit of Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, oh God, of which there is no law that comes against. Oh God, help us. Help us, Lord, to walk in the Spirit. Help us to walk in the Spirit. Lord, to grow in that new law, the Spirit of life. That we're no longer, no longer falling to the dominion of sin, but we're rising to the dominion of Christ by the indwelling power and presence of Holy Spirit. God, help us to rise above. Come on, can we sing together? Come on, lead us, Gil.